What up YouTube, it's Rules for Rebels here, and today we're going to be talking about Authorize.net. Uh, so I'll tell you guys right off the bat, for those of you guys who are just interested in making money and aren't really interested in the technical details of merchant processing, this video may be boring for you, although you may find it interesting and you may learn something new. Uh, but basically I'm going to be showing you the fraud detection suite filters you can set up on your Authorize.net account. So let me quickly explain how merchant processing works. I know most people new to merchant processing, you know, they know what PayPal is, they know what Stripe is. Though you can take payments using those, that's not technically a real merchant account. What that's called is a third party aggregator. So basically you're lumped onto a merchant account with like hundreds or thousands of other people all under the banner of, you know, Stripe or PayPal. Uh, now those, you know, there's nothing wrong with those. They, they work great. Um, it's easy to set up. You don't have to worry about having a merchant account and a virtual, uh, I'm sorry, and a payment gateway. However, if you were to get a true merchant account, you know, through somebody like First Data, for example, um, there's two parts to it. You have what's called your merchant account, and that's like your First Data account who has a bank that's processing your transactions. And then you have another part to it called a payment gateway. Now, a payment gateway is essentially basically turns your merchant account into a PayPal or Stripe like. Uh, back end where you can process things through a virtual terminal um, where you can check on the transactions that you've run through because standalone a merchant account can't do anything all it is is a merchant ID number you actually need to hook it up to a payment gateway to where you use your API keys to set it up to your Shopify store for example or set it up as a payment method on your eBay shop um, or you can do virtual terminal which is basically a customer calls you on the phone and you plug in their info and card number for them um, and I have a little bit of experience using merchant processes. I use PayPal, I use Stripe, but I also use Authorize.net and some different uh, payment gateways in the past as well. The one thing that's really confusing when you're first starting out, though, is uh, nobody really gives you guidance on how to, how to set your fraud filters. Um, you may or may not be a high risk for credit card chargebacks. If you sell high dollar items, uh, you're probably more likely to be targeted by credit card fraudsters. Uh, also, if you sell trendy items like hoverboards or whatever the you know hot new trend of the day is, you're more likely to be targeted. And some people just want to be extra protective and don't want to take the losses of credit card chargebacks. In my particular situation, I could really care less about the money. You know, I don't mean to sound like a douche and be like, oh, money's no object. You know, not not at all. You know, obviously, I don't like losing money, but uh, one of my businesses is considered high risk, and that means that it's nearly impossible to get merchant processing. Uh, it's been literally a two or three year long struggle for me. Um, I'm either kind of flying under the radar until I get you know busted, quote unquote, and they shut me down. Or companies will take me on knowing what I do, and then three months later, they'll shut me down for no reason. So I have to be very careful. I just got a legitimate you know, uh, merchant processing account. They know exactly what my business is. They have no issues with it. However, I need to keep the returns down, and I need to keep the chargebacks to like the zero, or they're going to cut me off. So uh, there are third-party companies that you can use as like fraud filters. Uh, Pay Certify is one. Uh, Riskify. Signified. There's a lot of different ones. They work differently. Some of them have like proprietary software that matches a customer's IP address to their billing address and their credit card to their normal transaction behavior. Um, some of them will send a customer a text message after they place an order and they have to verify that they're actually making the purchase. Um, you know, some of them are a little bit more of a hassle. Like I, I think, you know, Pay Certify actually sends a text message to the customer. To me, that seems a little bit uh, obtrusive is the wrong word, but I don't want to make my customers jump through any more hoops than they have to to do a transaction. I want as few barriers to them buying from me as possible. But at the same time, you need to protect yourself. So there's different you know options, different companies out there. Uh, if you're using Shopify, you know just go into the uh, Shopify. If you're using Shopify Payments, actually has an internal system that kind of checks for suspicious transactions. But there's also a bunch of third-party apps that you can download as well. Uh, but also within your authorized.net account, which we're looking at right now, they have a fraud detection suite. And I'm basically just going to take you through and show you some of these different tools. Um, so if you're currently using authorized.net, if you're experiencing chargebacks, if you just want to be extra cautious, uh, here are some filters that you can set up. And nobody really does, nobody really explains to you what these are or how they work. Um, so I'm going to go through here and just kind of explain these things to you. So daily report velocitor, uh, basically you can set the amount of transactions you want to allow per day. So you would just enable the filter 
And here it kind of explains what it is. The velocity filter allows you to specify a threshold for the number of transactions allowed per day. All transactions exceeding the threshold in that day will be flagged and processed according to the filter selection. So I set it at, I don't want to allow more than 50 transactions to go through per day. And then this filter is really not necessary, uh, in my opinion, but I have it set up anyways. Um, if we go over 50, I can set it to process as normal. I can set all of them over 50 to authorize and hold. I can do, do not authorize but hold for review or just outright decline it. You know, that's not really something that, that I think is that big of a deal. The AVS handling. So uh, the address verification system is a tool designed by bank card processors to assist in identifying possibly fraudulent credit card transactions. For every credit card authorization, the AVS compares the billing address and zip code provided by the customer at the time of purchase to the address and zip code on file. The AVS then returns a response code. Um, so sometimes this will catch things where you know, some people move and they just forget to update their address with their credit card. Some people may put in a different billing address than a shipping address. So you can choose, you know, the transaction was submitted without a billing address, decline. Like, I'm, I'm being extra strict on mine, uh, so I have all these declined. Um, here's the different types of settings we can have, but the AVS system is invalid or the AVS is not allowed, you know, decline, decline. I would recommend declining all of these. Um, down here we can basically check what um, what types of matches are we going to allow? So not a lot of people know their extended zip code. Like in Chicago, it's uh, 60610. I couldn't tell you what the last, you know, you know how your zip code would be like 60610-0432. I don't even know what my extended zip is. So I don't want to block people who don't know their extended zip. Or if the bank doesn't take the extended zip, I don't want to block that. Um, if the street address doesn't match, but the zip code and the extended zip do, I'll hold it for the review. If the street address doesn't match with the zip, I hold it for review. And I'll, I'll go in there personally and take a look and see what I think. Um, if the street address matches, but the zip and stuff doesn't, I'll hold for review. And I decline if the street address, zip code, and extended zip don't match. Uh, like I said, you know, everyone's situation is different. My filters are extra strict. You don't necessarily have to do it like I do, uh, but that's how I choose to do it. So then we have enhanced CVV handling filter. Um, I have that enabled. The card verification CV, CCV compares a three or four digit uh, code submitted in a transaction with the card code on file at that issuing bank. Uh, based on that comparison, the bank returns a CCV response. Um, and basically what this is, if you look on the back of your credit card, right by your signature, there's going to be a three or four digit number. On Visa and MasterCard, it's typically three digit. On Amex, it'll be a four digit on the front. Uh, basically, if somebody uses a stolen credit card, they often don't know what that CVV code is. It's often also referred to as a security code. And so basically, even somebody with a stolen card, if they don't, they may not know what that CVV. So I think the CVV, uh, or CCV in this case, is a really important tool. Uh, so if it doesn't match, I outright decline it. If it's not processed, I hold for review. If it should be, be on card but is not included, I hold for review. And if the issuer has or if the issuer hasn't provided an inscription key, again, I hold for review. If it's just one issue that's coming up here, I'll typically manually look at it and allow it to go through. If they're failing a couple different filters, then I'll decline the transaction. Uh, shipping address verification filter. The shipping address verification verifies that the shipping address received with an order is a valid postal address. And note, it says important, to ensure that transactions are run through the shipping address verification, you must edit your payment form setting to set the shipping address, city, state, zip code fields as required. So if you're not taking all that information, it's automatically going to give a decline. Regardless of whether you used advanced integration, AIM, or server integrated at method, SIM, for connecting to the payment gateway. If you authorize and hold for review as a filter action, once a transaction is held, we recommend you take action to approve. So basically, if, if they don't pass this filter, um, I authorize it and hold it for review. I only ship to a customer's billing address. I will not ship to a different address. Some customers don't like that, but you know, for, for my situation, it's just how it has to be. Uh, we have the IP address mismatch, mismatch filter. Uh, this basically just, you know, if somebody's placing an order from Canada and the order's going to Texas, there's a good chance that's fraud. So I actually need to change that. I normally have that as uh, hold for review. Um, it was set to process as normal. So we're going to check that one. Um, we have the regional IP address filter. I don't have this one enabled. Uh, the regional IP, IP address filter allows you to designate regions or countries you do not want to accept transactions from. So uh, I don't accept transactions from any of these countries, period. 
Um, but if you want to do an, you know, if you, if you ship worldwide, but you know, there's a lot of fraud in Antarctica or Asia or whatever, uh, you can block certain countries from ordering from you or, or block certain transactions from going through. The amount filter, this is an important one. Um, if you have a cap on how much you're willing to accept by credit card, you can limit that. So it could be for a number of reasons. I know Shopify, for example, doesn't allow you to uh, cap transactions at a certain, certain threshold. Some people don't want to allow large transactions because it leaves you vulnerable to uh, credit card chargebacks and credit card fraud. And some people would just, you know, if you're going to place a large order, you have to do it by cashier's check or bank wire because credit card processing fees are just too much. Uh, so if you want to control that, just go into the uh, transaction limit filter. You can set a lower limit and an upper limit. I have mine set at $999. Anything more than that, the customer can pay by a cashier's check or a bank wire. A, to protect myself from credit card chargebacks, and B, just because if you're ordering more than that, I'll give you a better price, but you know I don't feel like paying merchant processing fees on that. Um, we have the hourly velocity filter. I don't have this configured, but you can you know limit how many transactions come through in, a, in an hour. Um, we have the suspicious transaction filter, uh, which the suspicious transaction filter is a proprietary tool developed by a risk management team to identify suspicious transactions based on a vast knowledge of transaction behaviors and fraud detection analysis. The suspicion, uh, suspicion transaction filter provides enhanced fraud detection for your account. There are no merchant controlled configurations for this filter. The management of this filter is handled exclusively by our dedicated risk team. So uh, if they, if authorize.net comes across a transaction they think is suspicious, uh, I authorize it, but hold it for review. And basically like they really won't tell you what this filter is based off of because they don't want you knowing the ins and outs of how to commit credit card fraud basically. Um, but basically, you know, I've spoken to some people in the industry and basically they have tools. They can tell where you make most of your purchases. They can tell the phone number that you put on most orders. So just for example, let's say somebody steals a credit card number um, and they put in the customer's address and everything to make sure it goes through, but they put in their phone number. So in case there's like a customer service call or something, they're able to field that instead of the person whose card they're using knowing that they're using it. Uh, in this situation, that fraud filter would probably catch that and say, hey, you know, this person has never used this phone number on an online order before, something must be up, you know, let's hold it as suspicious. So that's what that one is. For most people, you could probably be okay just setting this one on do not authorize, but hold for review or authorize and hold for review and just ignoring the rest of the fraud filters because this is going to catch the most obvious stuff. Um, but like I said, in my situation, I can't afford to have a chargeback, uh, not from a money perspective, but because my account will be shut down. Uh, so for that reason, I'm being extra strict with mine. Uh, we have the billing shipping mismatch filter. Uh, this basically just verifies that the billing address is the same as the shipping address. Um, you know, if you're a florist, for example, pretty much 99.9% .9 of your transactions are not going to be going to the billing address because who orders flowers for themselves? Um, on the flip side, though, you know, I, I understand a lot of people want to have items shipped to their work. A lot of people want to have items shipped to a friend's house who's home during the day or whatever else if they're working. Uh, but my business, I only ship to a billing address. I make no exceptions to that rule, and therefore I don't allow those transactions to go through. And then lastly, we have the transaction IP velocity filter. And the transaction IP velocity filter allows you to specify the maximum number of transactions allowed from the same internet protocol IP address. So most scammers are probably smart enough that if they're placing fake credit card numbers, they're going to be basically using a... Uh, like a VPN or something to hide their IP address or change your IP address or a proxy. Um, however, the, the stupidest criminals out there uh, may not be smart enough to do that and may just continue placing orders from the same IP address or same coffee shop. Um, so the most transactions I'll allow from one IP address in an hour is two. Uh, the reason being sometimes somebody orders something from me and then it's like, oh, you know what, I, I forgot to add this onto the order and they'll come back and place another one. So I'll allow that twice. I won't allow it any more than twice. So. I realize it's kind of a dry subject matter here, but uh, you know it's been a while since I used Authorize.net. I've been using other solutions, um, and I'm back on Authorize.net. And when I when it came to setting up my fraud filter, I was a little bit kind of confused on how to set things up. Um, so it took some looking into and some researching and some investigating to decide how I wanted my stuff set up. Uh, again, I'm not recommending you guys copy me. I have my stuff set extra extra strict 
probably stricter than it needs to be, but at least for the first three months of this new merchant account, I want to be extra protective because I think one charge back and they're going to kick me off and I'm going to be without processing. So I'm being extra strict. You probably don't need to be. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If so, give me a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe and check us out on future videos. Talk to you later, guys.